Chapter 12 The spirit bear approached Cole with slow, lazy stride, its head held low. Cole clenched his fist. Maybe he could hold up his arm. Maybe he had enough energy for one last swing. Ten feet away, the bear paused where Cole's spit had hit the grass. It lowered its head and sniffed. Still eyeing Cole, the spirit bearer casually licked up the spit, raised its head, eyes mild and curious, then turned and sauntered away. Cole felt a sudden rush of tears and emotion. Death would be okay if it came fast, existence ending in one last violent moment of defiance. Cole could understand that kind of death, but here he lay, exposed, alone, ignored, his life leaking from his body like water from some rusty bucket. Even a bear considered him insignificant, licking up his spit as casually as if it were due. The spirit bear never once slowed or looked back. Cole fought back his tears until the last trace of white faded into the thick underbrush, and then he began to sob. He was dying, alone and insignificant, and nobody cared. Drifting off into a dream world, Cole imagined he was a baby bird in a nest. Around him a storm raged, and the trees swayed violently. Driving rain pelted him like hail. Frantic, Cole struggled to fly, but he couldn't escape the nest. All he could do was open his beak wide and raise it upward towards the sky, the action a simple admission that he was powerless. There were no conditions, no vices, no lies, no deceit, no manipulation, only submission and a simple desire to live. He wanted to live, but for that he needed help. Otherwise his life would end in the nest. Suddenly the violent winds calmed and the rain stopped. Cole strained upward with his open beak as his senses drifted back into the real world of pain. Again, he was as one it was in his wounded body on an island prison. The storm had stopped and something had awakened him, an overpowering animal smell. His eyes opened. Looming over Cole, its breath warm and musty, towered the spirit bear, inches away. Its legs rose like pillars beside Cole's arms, and mist glistened on its white hair the world stopped. For Cole, there was no wind, no cold, no time, no pain, no sound. There existed only one object, the spirit bear. Its shiny black eyes held eternity. Its intense gaze penetrated, never wavering. Surprisingly, Cole did not feel the terror he had once known. Maybe the spirit bear had come to kill him. Maybe it was only curious. Whatever the reason, Cole gazed calmly back up at the bear. He knew he would fight to the last moment to live. Any animal would do that. Even worms coiled back and forth to escape capture and death. But Cole also knew that if he died, his time had arrived. It would be like the baby birds, or like the worms, or the mouse. It was his turn. Cole's eyes watered and he blinked. This was the end, then. Resigned to his fate, he gazed into the bear's eyes, but found no aggression, only curiosity. It was as if the bear were waiting. But waiting for what? Instinctively, Cole gathered what little spit he could in his mouth. When the meager fluid bathed his tongue, he stopped, paused, and then swallowed. Cole did not understand why he had swallowed, or what happened next. Hesitantly, he raised his left hand off the ground. As if reaching for an electric fence, he cautiously extended his fingers towards the spirit bear's shoulder. Inches away, he paused. Awareness flickered in the bear's eyes. Cole forced his hand forward until his fingers touched the bear's moist, wet coat. If he was going to die, he wanted to know what the animal felt like that killed him. Still, the bear remained motionless. Cole's fingers sank into the bushy white hair until he touched solid body. With his fingertips, he felt warmth. He felt the bear's breath and heartbeat, and he felt one more thing. He felt trust. But why? Already he had tried to kill the bear. He had spit at it. This bear had defied him, and he had hated it with every fiber of his existence. Still, touching the bear, Cole paused. Then he drew his hand away. The spirit bear never blinked, never twitched a muscle. Only when Cole's hand again rested on the ground, only then did the towering animal lower its huge head as if nodding. A second time it dipped its head, then stepped back away. With one fluid motion it swung around, and a and ambled silently down towards the water line. Cole watched, forgetting to breathe. He expected the bear to stop when it reached the shoreline. 
but the great white animal waded into the water and swam with powerful strokes out into the bay towards the open ocean. A thin wake spread like a giant V behind the departing creature until it became a silhouetted speck, finally disappearing. Cole let his imagination keep the bear vis visible a while longer. Finally, even the image faded. Cole blinked and took a breath, as if he were awakening. Around him, the large or the land had come alive. A clear horizon showed under a dark blanket of clouds. Reflections of blue and gray swirled on the water as a fresh breeze ruffled the spruce bows and sent ripples along the shoreline. Seagulls screeched and squawked their way out over the bay, diving and hunting for food. Barely a hundred feet away, the mother seal and her spotted pups appeared, their dog-like heads peeking out of the water. The air still carried the rotten smell of vomit and death, but also the fresh odor of seaweed and moss and cedar and salt. Vivid colors glistened wet in the bright light. A strange thought occurred to Cole. The world was beautiful. Yes, the world was beautiful. Even the wet moss and crushed grass near his hand was beautiful. Staring at the delicate patterns, he wondered why he had never noticed this all before. How much beauty had he missed his lifetime? How much beauty has he destroyed? But the past was another time and another life that Cole could never recapture, and didn't want to. He knew only the moment, and this moment he was alive, the most alive he had ever felt. It struck Cole as odd that he should feel this way at the very moment that his body had reached the point at which it could no longer exist. Even as he stared at the moss, deep inside him the balance was shifting to the other side. Clinging to life was like hanging from a bar on the playground at school. On the playground he could hold on for a long time, but when his grip finally tired, his fingers slipped quickly and he fell. <laughs> now Cole felt himself slipping away. He had struggled too long to hold on, his energy bleeding away. Now it was his turn to die. This thought made Cole sad, but he accepted it. He felt content. Before the end of life, he had seen beauty. He had trusted and been trusted. That was enough. Cole's head rested on a patch of spongy moss that acted as a pillow. His pain seemed to float like a haze outside his body. He closed his eyes, relaxed, and let the balance shift. And, as it shifted, Cole felt himself floating upward into a cloud. Gradually, a buzzing sound gathered in his head, growing louder and louder. The sound bothered Cole. He wanted quiet now. Abruptly, the buzzing stopped and squawking seagulls surrounded his body. He could hear them arguing over him. This was what it felt like to die. He hadn't imagined it being so noisy. The seagulls began pecking at his arms and legs. Cole could not open his eyes, but he jerked his arm. Why couldn't the seagulls leave him alone? Why couldn't they wait just a little longer until he had died? Did they have to pick meat off his bones while he was still breathing? Instead of stopping, the pecking grew worse. Now the gulls were pulling at his legs and shoulders with giant beaks trying to lift him. Bizarre sensations bombarded Cole as his body was dragged and bumped across the rocks. Sharp pain stabbed through his wounds. Then the loud cry of the seagulls turned into garbled gibberish as they tugged at his shirt and shoes. What were they doing to him? Gradually, soft and warm sensations enveloped Cole, like being wrapped in a blanket. His head was tilted forward and warm liquid filled his mouth. It didn't make sense. How could rain be warm? His head must be in a puddle with muddy water running past his lips. Or maybe it was blood. He spit out the liquid and felt it warm on his neck. He didn't want to drown in blood or muddy water. But again, warm liquid flowed past his lips and Cole gave in didn't matter anymore how he died. He could drown, freeze, or be pecked apart by seagulls. All that mattered was that the balance had changed, and now he was drift drifting over the edge. Hang in there, champ! Hang in there! A voice sounded. The buzzing sounded again, louder, deafening, like a swarm of giant bees preparing to attack. Then the world tilted and bounced. With each bounce, pain throbbed in Cole's chest. Something cradled his neck and steadied his head while the jarring grew too intense. He kept trying to push himself over the edge, but again his head was lifted and more warm fluid flowed past his lips. Hang with me, champ! Cole spit out another mouthful. The sweet fluid was keeping his pain alive, allowing all the bouncing and the noise to continue, but nothing could stop it from leaking past his teeth and swollen parched tongue. 
the warm fluid flowed down into his throat and brought back the cold. Chills raked his body in uncontrolled spasms. He moaned. When would this horrible nightmare ever end? Then, suddenly, he awoke. His eyes opened and nothing made sense. Gone were the bay and the fallen tree. A dark and restless sky still moved overhead, but where was the hard ground, the wet, the mud, the dead birds? A thick blanket held both of his arms in close to his chest. The blanket was brown and not the colorful atow. Where was the atow? Cole's vision was blurred, but he understood that he was lying in the bottom of a shallow aluminum skiff. Kneeling on one knee, steering was Edwin, the Klingit elder who had helped bring him out to the island. Instead of his normal, detached, faraway look, Edwin's eyebrows furrowed with concern. Cole blinked hard to focus. Had head, his head rested on someone's lap. Then he recognized Garvey leaning over him, his face haggard with worry. "'We'll be home soon!' Garvey shouted above the roar of the engine. Too weak to answer, Cole let his eyes close again. He struggled to recall what happened, but couldn't. Garvey shouted something to Edwin, and the engine revved louder. Spray whipped across the bow as the boat surged into the waves. Cole held his breath and tensed to listen the pain in his ribs. It was as if someone were beating on his chest with a bat. He felt Garvey's strong grip tighten each time they hit a big wave. The hard bucketing, hard, hard bucking lasted forever, and Cole was drunk with pain by the time the boat finally slowed. The screaming of the engine grew muted, replaced by anxious voices shouting to them. Garvey and Edwin shouted back. Then the boat bumped against something. Cole opened his eyes. They had pulled alongside a dock. A cluster of people crowded next to the boat, staring down at him. People were moving, reaching, shouting. Cole cried out in pain as he was lifted from the boat. His ribs and leg felt as if they were being ripped from his body. Someone slipped, and Cole's legs scraped against the edge of the dock. He heard himself cry out. More footsteps pounded and voices shouted. The dock swayed, and Cole grabbed blindly at the air to stop the world from moving. He couldn't take any more of this torture. It had become violent. The commotion continued, tilting dangerously back and forth. Cole felt himself lifted onto a stretcher and carried up the dock to a waiting van. Doors slammed, a motor revved, and there was more bouncing as the van raced down the road. Cole's pa pain faded into delirium. The next ex sensation was entering a room and being lifted onto a soft, warm bed. Careful hands dried him and worked his pants off. He dreamed that the spirit bear was ripping at his leg, but instead of a growl, a woman's soft voice said, Easy, easy, you'll be okay, just relax. Cole's uncontrolled shivers were replaced by hot sweating as a towel patted his forehead. When the commotion finally stopped, Cole lay completely spent, drifting in and out of consciousness. He felt a warm blanket being tucked in around his neck, and he opened his eyes. Where was the atow? Seeing Cole's eyes open, Edwin and Garvey stepped forward, one on each side of his bed. Edwin studied Cole. "'Sure busted yourself up,' he said plainly. Garvey nodded agreement. "'Lightning knocked down a big tree. The branches must have hit you.' Cole tried to speak, but no words came to his throat. A short, round-faced Klingit woman crowded in beside the bed. "'His wounds aren't from any tree,' she said, pulling back the blanket. "'Look.' Edwin glanced down at the bloody red gashes surrounded by puffy, ashen skin and whistled low. Those are bite and claw wounds. The woman nodded. He's been attacked by a bear. Cole nodded. Fear flashed in Garvey's eyes. I'm okay. Cole succeeded in grunting weakly. A thin smile faded to hide Garvey's concern. Half your bones are busted. Your body's swollen like one huge mosquito bite and you're nearly starved to death. Believe me, champ, you're not okay. Cole forced a nod. I am okay, he grunted again. Chapter 13 A short, squat man poked his head inside Cole's room. Ketchikin can't send a medevac plane until morning, he called out. It's getting dark, and weather's set in. The nurse felt Cole's forehead. Looks like you'll be spending the night at Rosie's one-star hotel. Edwin nodded at Cole. If you hadn't guessed, this is Rosie. A rare smile ceased his lip, 
creased his lips. She's the best nurse in Drake. The only nurse, Rosie added. If you live through Rosie, Edwin said, you'll live through anything. Cole shuddered with another spasm of chills as Rosie gave Edwin a light shove. You and Garvey go make yourselves useful, she said. Get another blanket. Garvey handed Rosie the atal blanket off a chair beside the bed. Here, we brought this in from the island. It's damp, she said. Grab a fresh one from the closet. When Cole spotted the colorful blanket beside him, he felt a sudden warmth. He reached out and grabbed its edge. Garvey studied Cole, letting him clutch the wet atal, as Edwin brought another blanket. He squeezed Cole's shoulder. We'll talk more later. Get some rest now. Cole let go of the atal and gripped Garvey's arm. I'm not going anywhere, Garvey reassured him. Rosie and I will be here all night with you. Thanks, Cole whispered. Rosie pushed in beside the bed. This might sting a little. She poked a needle into Cole's left arm. I'm starting an IV drip to get some fluids and antibiotics into you. Finishing, she tilted Cole's head up and put some pills gently inside his mouth. Now take these tablets. They should help with the pain. Cole sipped water from the glass she held to his lips and struggled to swallow the pills. When they finally went down, Rosie began working on Cole's wounds. The door opened and another Klingit woman brought in a thermos of hot soup and set it next to the bed. Rosie turned to Garvey. Maybe you can get some food into this guy. Edwin remained standing along the wall, watching intensely, as Garvey placed a big pillow under Cole's head and ladled spoonfuls of chicken broth between his cracked lips. Cole's pain dulled as the medication took effect. Sipping soup, he watched Rosie. She worked cheerfully, as if they were nothing in the world she would rather be doing. When she left the room for more dressings, Garvey turned to Cole. That bear used you for a chew toy. He pursed his lips with, concern, with concern. I'm sorry for getting you into this. Cole had many things he wanted to explain, but he was too weak and tired now. He shook his head. My fault, he whispered. Cole had many things he wanted to explain, but he was too weak and tired now. Oops, I already read that. Sorry. Garvey glanced at Edwin, who kept his focused gaze. Rosie returned to the bed, her hands filled with rolls of gauze and brown plastic bottle. Garvey moved away from the bed to give her room. You get some rest with Rosie finishes while Rosie finishes patching you up, he said to Cole. Can't do much patching, Rosie said. He has broken bones. I wish we had him in a hospital tonight. Cole closed his eyes while Rosie cleaned and bandaged his wounds. The medication made him sleepy. Finishing her work, Rosie whispered to Garvey, That bear had quite a time with him. He has broken ribs and maybe a broken pelvis, and to that hypothermia and a broken leg and arm. I'm surprised he's even talking. Must be a tough kid. Not as tough as he thinks, Garvey whispered back. Edwin murmured. He'll be okay if he ever finds a reason to live. Cole heard everyone's words as he drifted off. He slept troubled, dreaming of, me of people he knew coming towards him out of a misty haze. Each person helped him. Garvey fed him. Rosie fixed his wounds. His father gave him money. Edwin offered him advice. His mother cleaned him and handed him new clothes. Cole liked being helped. He liked using people. Suddenly a bolt of lightning struck, and all the people turned into monsters. Everything they had done for Cole faded, and they laughed at him. You fool, they called. Why should we do anything for you? You're nothing. You're a baby-faced con. Cole awoke in a sweat. It was night. He searched the darkness frantically. He heard regular breaths near him in the dark. Garvey? He called, realizing he could talk. Garvey? Garvey's hoarse voice answered. You okay, Cole? Cole heard someone getting up to snap the lights on. Garvey, still wearing his rumpled jeans and faded wool shirt, hurried to his bedside. A door opened from the next room and Rosie rushed in. What's wrong? she asked. Cole looked at the two of them, his nightmare still haunting him. I had a dream, he said, his voice raspy. People helped me, then they turned into monsters and laughed at me. It was just a dream, Garvey said, resting his head on Cole's arm. But you two were there. Rosie took Cole's hand in hers. Well, I'm not a monster, she smiled. Maybe Garvey is. Cole didn't smile. Why do you guys help me? Rosie looked at her watch. It sure isn't for the pay in good hours. Then she shrugged. Why live if you can't help others and make the world a better place? Cole looked up at Garvey. 
Why do you help me? Because we're friends. Cole let his frustration show. No, you didn't even know me when you first started helping me in Minneapolis. Garvey studied Cole before answering. You're right. I did it for myself. Cole nodded. That's what I figured. You didn't care about me. You were... You're wrong, Garvey said. I did care about you, but helping others is how I help myself. You need help? Cole asked, surprised. Garvey nodded. I see a lot of myself in you. When I was your age, I spent five long years in prison for things I'll go to my grave regretting. I lived my early years here in Drake, but no one cared enough to take me through circle of justice. If they had, maybe things would have been different. He shook his head with a sad smile. Take my word for it. Jail scars the soul, and I was never able to help those I hurt. Cole, Rosie said, touching his bandaged arms. In a few months, your body will heal, but time won't heal your mind as easily. Helping others can help heal your wounds of the spirit. Still troubled by his dream, Cole said, There are people who want to hurt me. Rosie squeezed Cole's hand. Those are the people who need your help. I'll bet you weren't a bundle of fun when Garvey first met you. Cole shook his head. How's your pain? Rosie asked. I hurt, Cole said. The Clingant nurse unwrapped a packet and prepared a syringe and needle. Let's give you something to help you sleep. Give me something to take away the monsters, Cole said. Only you can do that, she answered. Cole slept hard, his first real sleep in many days. When he awoke, a small lamp glowed in the dark near his bed. Rosie was already up, working quietly around the room. When she heard him stir, she snapped on the lights and came over beside the bed. Did you sleep well? she asked. Cole nodded. Let's clean your dressings this morning, she said. The people in Ketchikin think we're witch doctors out here in the sticks. Cole grimaced. The pain had returned with a vengeance. Rosie saw him wince and gave him another shot. Things will hurt worse before they're better, she said. Just warning you so you'll know what to expect. Then she added, but they really will get better. While Cole waited for the medication to dull the pain, Garvey sat upright on his cot and stretched the kinks out of his back. He ran a hand through his tousled hair. How about if I get some breakfast, he said. Rosie nodded approved as she hung a fresh IV. Again, she took Cole's temperature and pulse. Then she brought over a paper bag containing his clothes. Here, she said, placing the bag beside the bed. There wasn't much left of your clothes, but I had them washed anyways to take with you. Cole eyed the colorful a towel blanket folded on top of the bag. As Garvey returned with juice and warm oatmeal, Edwin appeared at the door and announced, The plane's in the air. Should be landing in about thirty minutes. He turned to Rosie. After Cole eats, let's get him down to the dock. I've got help coming. By the time Cole finished eating, two boys from the village had arrived to help lift him. The boys, both Cole's age, eyed him curiously as they carried him on a stretcher out to a waiting van. Rosie rode beside Cole in the van holding his IV bag. When they reached the mar marina, the boys again helped Garvey and Edwin carry the stretcher to the end of the dock. Rosie hung Cole's IV from a dock post. I'll be right back, she said. I need your medication records from the van. The boys followed Rosie, leaving Edwin and Garvey alone with Cole. Edwin looked out at the horizon, glowing red with early dawn. Tell me what happened out there, he said. I didn't think anybody cared about me anymore. Cole said, struggling to speak. That's why I burned the shelter. Hesitantly, he explained how he had tried to escape the island and how he was mauled trying to kill the spirit bear. I wanted to kill it because it wasn't scared of me, he admitted. As Garvey and Edwin listened, he continued, telling next about the storm. When Cole had finished, Garvey said, You may never have use of that arm again. Life made up Life is made up of consequences, and you've sure made some bad choices. Cole nodded. My arm isn't important. Garvey gave Cole a puzzled look. Why do you say that? If I like the cake, maybe the ingredients are okay, too. Cole smiled weakly. A famous parole officer told me that once. Garvey raised an eyebrow. A famous parole officer let you get mauled by a bear? Now you'll end up in a hospital. When you're released, 
you'll still have your parents to deal with, and you'll still be facing a jail term. I doubt the hearing circle will consider returning you to the island after what's happened. You realize all that, don't you? Cole nodded. I do, but it's okay. Whatever happens now, I'm done being mad. Edwin shook his head. A person is never done being mad. Anger is a memory never forgotten. You only tame it. He pointed out towards the island. Tell me more about this spirit bear. The bear was pure white, Cole said. The last time it came, it stood right over me. He spoke in a whisper. I reached up and I touched it. Edwin studied Cole. Spirit bears live hundreds of miles south of here off the coast of British Columbia, not here in these islands. He shook his head. We've hunted here since I was, yo was young, and so have my parents, and their parents. There are no spirit bears around here except maybe in your mind. Cole started to argue, then remembered the handful of white hair he had pulled off the bear. Want to bet? he said, reaching for his pants in the bag beside him. Suddenly he paused. His life had become filled with lies, and the more he lied, the more he always tries to prove he was right. Never had he been strong enough to simply tell the truth. Cole put down the bag. Today, things would change. From now on, he would speak the truth, even if it meant going to jail. He spoke softly. I don't need to prove anything. I'm telling the truth. Edwin narrowed his eyes at Cole. Then he turned and walked up the dock. Looks like I'm going to catch Ken with you, Garvey said. I need to go get my things. I'll be right back. As he turned to leave, he winked. Don't go anywhere. Cole watched Garvey leave. Finding himself alone, he looked out at the mirrored water. Maybe he had never really seen the spirit bear. He strained his neck to make sure nobody was watching, then reached into the paper bag and pulled out his jeans. Carefully, he poked his hand into the front pocket and wrapped his fingers around something matted and fuzzy. He pulled his hand from the bag and opened his fist. There in the palm of his hand was a wad of hair. Cole stared. The hair was white. All white. It's true, he whispered. I wasn't lying. Deliberately, he raised his hand and tossed the hair into the water. Beginning today, he would tell the truth. His words would become his only proof. As loud voices approached the dock and a plane droned over his head, overhead circling to land, Cole watched the white patch of hair. It floated on the water, and the breeze tugged it out away from the dock. The little clump bobbed about, drifting with the tide, then finally blinked from sight. Smiling, Cole rested his head on the stretcher. Edwin had said that anger was a memory never forgotten. That might be true, but the spirit bear was also a memory that would never disappear from his mind or heart. Part 2. Return to Spirit Bear Chapter 14. Six Months Later Cole hobbled slowly, but without help, down the sidewalk, leaning away from the hospital. No longer did he have full use of his right arm. His many scars made him stiff, and limping helped ease the pain, gnawing at his hip. Garvey walked patiently alongside. Cole's mother followed several long steps behind. Beside her walked the guard, who had arrived to escort Cole back to the detention center. The guard watched the, with closed eyes. He had wanted to handcuff Cole, but Garvey took him aside. A heated discussion followed. Finally, the guard nodded, reluctantly, and allowed Cole to walk freely during the transfer. Cole's father had never once visited the hospital, nor had he chosen to be there today. Nobody mentioned him as the group crossed the parking lot towards a parking station wagon. Parked station wagon. His absence didn't surprise Cole. One month after Cole's return from the island, the police had arrested and formally charged his father with child abuse. He denied all the accusations, of course, and paid bail before the ink dried on the warrant. He might have never been charged except for Garvey's words to Cole's mother. Standing beside Cole's bed in the hospital, he had said to her, This is what has come from your silence. Keep quiet now, and you share the blame. The next day, she reluctantly agreed to press charges and testify. During Cole's hospital stay, many people from the circle had visited him, including his mother, her visits had been the hardest. She spoke little except to wring her hands and ask, How are you doing? Each visit, she repeated, I love you. You know that, don't you? Cole didn't know what to say at those times. Why now, all of a sudden? 
should he believe she cared. She visited every day, but that didn't prove anything. She still wasn't there at night. Nobody was there after dark when visiting hours ended, when Cole was left alone with his thoughts. That was when he re relived the nightmare of the mauling and felt the ache of being alone. The fear, and yes, still the anger. Edwin had been right. Anger was a memory, memory never forgotten. But late at night, Cole also remembered the baby sparrows. As he returned touching, re remembered touching the spirit bear, he remembered the white hair and the gentle eyes, black orbs that peered patiently at him through the dark. Remembering those eyes brought Cole a certain calm. Cole hugged his lame right arm in close to his chest as he turned and glanced back at the hospital. It felt good to be leaving. It had been six months since the spirit bear sank its teeth into his hip and arm and raked his chest into hamburger. Even now, red puffy scars still crisscrossed Cole's body and served as painful reminders of the mauling. Although his body had begun to heal, Cole knew that many more months of therapy lay ahead. What happened to your body would have killed many people, the physical therapist had said. You're lucky to be alive, and your body will continue to react to the trauma for a long time. You will never have full use of your right arm again. Some nerve damage and blood flow will remain it repair itself, but you'll always have areas of weakness, numbness, and poor circulation. Damaged muscle and cartilage, cartilage will stiffen your joints. Wounds will build, build scar tissue. That can cripple you if you let it. Fight back. Stretch, run, pull, push. Anything to expand your range of motion. You're in a battle with your body now. Lose and you end up crippled the rest of your life. As they reached the guard station wagon, Garvey turned to Cole. The ther therapist told you only about your physical healing. That's the easy part. He pointed at Cole's head. Healing up there is much harder. I don't know what the justice system will do with you now that you've burned your bridges. I'll stop by the detention center tomorrow and we'll talk. I'll stop by too, Cole's mother said, her voice barely loud enough to be heard. Suddenly she reached out and hugged Cole, clinging to him. He heard her sob. Cole felt embarrassed, but did not push her away. Instead, he placed his hands on her shoulder until she released him. He swallowed a big lump that had grown in his throat. I'll be okay, Mom, he said, crawling into the vehicle. Fasten your seatbelt, ordered the guard. As Cole fumbled with the buckets, buckles, he nodded goodbye to Garvey and his mother. Now what, he thought to himself. As long as he had been in the hospital, he hadn't worried much about the future. Each day had been filled with surgeries and follow-up surgeries, physical therapy, daily visits from his mother and from Garvey, and a constant flow of visitors from the circle wishing him well. Cole peered out the side window of the station wagon as they drove across town. Would he end up going to jail now? And what would happen to his father? He couldn't picture his father in jail. All too soon, the station wagon pulled to a stop in front of the detention center. Cole's pulse quickened as he eyed the familiar stark brick building. Obediently, he crawled out, letting the guard hold his elbow to escort him inside past the locked doors. He wore new clothes his mother had brought for him, all he owned now, including the towel blanket, fit in the small duffel bag he carried over his shoulder. Cole found himself assigned to a different room than before. Not that it mattered. This one had the same plain walls, cement table, and bed. The only difference was the toilet. The one... This one was dull green. The other had been tan. When the guard closed the door, Cole walked over to the bed and hung the towel over the bed frame, where each hour and minute it would remind him of the island. Then he sat down. He closed his eyes and drew in a deep breath. Sitting there, it was easy to remember the island, the storm, the cold, the lightning, the fallen tree, the dead sparrows, and the mauling. Now he would find out whether he could still remember the gentleness of the spirit bear. When Garvey stopped by the next afternoon, he looked rushed. Did you get settled? he asked. How do you settle in a prison cell? Garvey smiled and pointed to his head. It's all up here. Did you find out what's going to happen to me now? Yes and no. As soon as it can be arranged, the Justice Circle will meet again with you. Because of what happened, they will probably relinquish authority over you and your case and send it back to the court system. Then what? Then, I'm afraid you go to trial and face sentencing. A jail term? Garvey nodded. Most likely. Cole looked down and picked at his thumbnail. How are you feeling about that? 
asked Garvey. I'm wishing I had blown my chance hadn't blown my chance on the island. Garvey nodded. We all have things we wish we could do over again. Some day I'm going to back to the island, Cole said. Garvey glanced up curiously. Any reason? To see the spirit bear again. Ah, the great white bear, Garvey said. You don't believe I really saw one, do you? You saw something, champ, Garvey said with a frown. Something chewed you up and spit you out. The bear didn't try to hurt me, Cole said. How do you know that? <laughs> Cole hesitated. When my dad uses a belt on me, I know he's trying to hurt me. I see it in his eyes. The bear was different. It was just trying to protect itself because I tried to kill it. Ever wonder why your dad beats you? Cole looked up, surprised. I've never done anything to him. I didn't say you did. He just whips me because he's mad. Garvey smiled. Remind you of anybody we know? When Cole didn't answer, Garvey shrugged and walked towards the door. I have to run, champ, he said. You think I'm lying about the spirit bear, don't you? Cole blurted. Garvey paused in the doorway. No, you're not lying. I think you believe you saw one, he said. During the next week, Cole settled into the monotony, monotonous routine of the detention center. His father still didn't visit. Each day, however, Garvey stopped by, as did Cole's mother. His mother seemed a little different now, happier, and more sure of herself. She wore casual clothes to visit instead of dressing up. Maybe when this is all over, we can go start a new life somewhere, she said one day. It will never be over, Cole said. That's up to us, she said. I've quit drinking. Cole studied his mother. Why? A faraway look crept into her eyes. Nineteen years ago, when your father and I were newly married, we were just like any other young couple, in love and full of dreams. We dreamed of having you, raising you, and having an ideal family. We never meant for things to turn out this way. What happened? Somewhere we took a wrong turn. Life got to be more than we could handle. Your father carried too much baggage from his past. Baggage he never dealt with. What do you mean, baggage? She smiled sadly. Your father isn't a bad person, but when he was younger, he had parents who beat, beat him for everything he did. That's all he ever knew. When I saw him start doing it to you, I kept telling myself things would get better. Drinking helped me ignore reality. She shook her head. I took a divorce, and you ending up in the hospital to wake me up. I realized I couldn't change your father, but I could change me. I'm sorry you've gone through all of you have. Can you ever forgive me? You weren't the one who hit me. No, but I didn't try to stop it. I wasn't there when you needed me. It's okay, Cole said. No, it's not okay, but maybe we can change things. Cole studied her curi curiously. This is the first time you've ever talked to me about this. She touched his hand. This is the first time you've been mauled by a bear. Then she gave Cole a big hug. Cole clung to his mother even after she let go, then turned away to hide his misty eyes. One week later, Garvey announced, The Justice Circle meets tomorrow night. I'll stop by to ride over with you. Does Mom know? Garvey nodded. And so does your dad. By the way, we have a little surprise for you tomorrow night. What's that? Garvey gave no answer as he left. True to his word, Garvey ride the following evening. Cole was surprised that the guard did not handcuff him as long as Garvey accompanied them. They arrived at the public library a little after seven o'clock. Already the circle had gathered. Cole recognized most of the faces as those from the old circle, including his lawyer, Nathaniel Blackwood. Peter's lawyer was there, but Peter was missing, and so were Peter's parents. Also, noticeably missing from the circle was Cole's dad. As before, the circle began with the keeper giving prayer while everyone stood and held hands. As they sat down, Cole noticed that Garvey kept glancing over his shoulder towards the door. Several times, he checked his watch. After introductions, the keeper described briefly all that had happened and why they were gathered again. She told about Cole burning the supplies, trying to escape, and being mauled. Then she ended by telling how he had spent six months in the hospital. That wasn't the whole story, Cole thought. 
She didn't know about the baby sparrows, the storm, trying to survive, how cold it had been, how alone he had felt, or that he had seen and touched a spirit bear. Cole's response to this opportunity was very disappointing, the keeper concluded. He broke his contract with the circle and he violated our trust. Is there anything more this circle ha can reasonably do? One by one, the circle members held the feather and expressed their disappointment over what had happened. My belief is that this situation should no longer be handled by the circle, one member finally said. Most of the others nodded their agreement. Again, Cole noticed Garby glancing towards the door. Suddenly, the door opened, and everyone turned to look. In walked Edwin. The Clinket elder seemed totally out of place here in Minneapolis. He still wore his faded old blue jeans, but instead of his torn t-shirt, he wore a baggy sweatshirt that covered up most of his pot belly. I'm sorry for arriving late, he announced. Here in the city, you have something we don't have in our village. Traffic. The circle members chuckled as Garvey asked permission to speak. The keeper handed him the feather, and Garvey introduced everyone to the Klingit elder. May I join your circle? Edwin asked reverently. The keeper nodded. Yes, please do, she said, bringing another chair into the circle and placing it immediately to her left. As Edwin seated himself, he looked over at Cole and nodded. Cole smiled back. The keeper motioned for the feather to continue around the circle. We were just getting ready to hear from Cole, she said. Cole, would you please tell us why you've broken your contract with the circle? Explain why we shouldn't transfer your case back to the court system for prosecution and sentencing. <laughs>